Hi, Chris. Morning, James. We've talked about some real scenarios where people have planned for things to go right and they haven't gone right. But what happens if you're really gumming it? Things like sailing along, it's looking really great, you're on the edge of glory, the lights are shining bright for you, and then there's just that piece of bad luck. That piece of bad luck, yeah. (laughs) It's funny, I've seen it a few times, particularly in, uh, let's just say a handful of people want to be the next Uber of, insert business name. So we're going to be the Uber of tourism. And I've seen it a few times where people are trying to create a program where they are the intermediary between the customer and the ultimate supply or end end service, right? And as the intermediary, we're taking a clip of whatever the flow of funds is between the customer to the actual service provider, we're just going to take a clip of that. Beautiful part about that, James. I could be asleep. My program's running 24-7, 365 or 366 in the leap year, and I'm making money. That's an awesome job. That's an awesome job, isn't it? uh, Of course, there's also been a few times where people try to create that right on the edge of glory, as we were saying, James, and just something went horribly wrong. So we've talked previously about... I'm going to sell pies. And we talked about the fact that if you want to have a super pie empire, but it's not actually such a great idea. There's only so many times a week most people want to eat a pie. Yeah. But in this case, we're talking about something like an app or a concept. Hey, this has got some legs. People want to go somewhere. People come and stay in their hotel or they have their adventure. How do I link those people together? Is that an example of something where you said, what could possibly go wrong here? In order to create a software that can be this intermediary, you know, the next Uber of. And if people are paying attention to Uber, I mean, we're talking like a quite a quantum sum of capital goes into creating this thing, particularly if you're using external software developers as opposed to you developing it yourself. Now, I don't know if you and I have the patience to learn how to code. Mm. (laughs) I certainly don't, Uh, nor do I have the time to be able to do it. So most likely I'm going to have to outsource it. So now my capital need to create this Uber of is now a lot higher. But in terms of the theme being right on the edge of glory, but for this one piece of bad luck, I think one of the businesses that ended up landing in my lap in liquidation was actually a uh, very smart director, very cognizant of his duties, very uh, conservative, not wanting to do the wrong thing. He was creating um, effectively an app that would take, uh, if I was a tourist and I wanted to go to a particular tourist attraction, I could book that attraction through his website and then that would then produce a ticket to the customer to then go on whatever the tourist attraction that he's partnering with and he had several partners in um, some of the islands off uh, Queensland there that would obviously offer up these tourist services and the customers were mostly overseas uh, tourists the pieces of bad luck this guy I think he came to the end of his tether at the start of the COVID pandemic but what had hit him twice before was Tourist season in Australia is a small window of time. It's about September to, say, February. That's your window of time to take advantage of overseas tourism and really uh, make some good money. Two seasons before, cyclones. So cyclones come in and effectively all tourism virtually stops. And any overseas tourist that sees Australia in cyclone thinks the whole of Australia is in a cyclone. Like, there goes my Tasmanian holiday. Yeah. It's all shot. Okay, yeah. 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 We've got a cyclone coming into Cairns. Yeah. Oh, well, better not go to Tasmania. Yeah, Correct. Right, gotcha, yeah. Then the next season after cyclones was bushfires. And again, once you see that the bushfires are raging in you know Victoria and New South Wales, you think the whole of Australia is on fire. So again, bushfires are raging in the southern states and all of a sudden we're losing tourism to the far north Queensland. And so that was the second year. So this guy is literally trying everything he can. He's throwing everything at this kitchen sink to make this thing work. And then, of course, the last thing that's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back on this great idea and the, and the great business model he was putting together was the COVID pandemic. So he's been hit three tourist seasons in a row of things out of his control. Let's call it an act of God without having to spur any controversy there. But three acts of God causes uh, his business to fail. We haven't had any frog epidemics and other sort of biblical type. But in terms of end of days for a business, this is pretty tough to survive. So you'd sit there and say, talked about you should have a a bit of a store away for your money, so your tax should be separated. You're not going to run out of cash to pay those hard bills that come up. We've talked about the fact that you should sort of have some plans and contingencies, but running businesses, sometimes there's not a lot of cash to spare. So if you're running a business in Queensland, 
you probably got to be watching out for some bad weather. If you're running some business in Victoria, you got to watch out for sometimes the bushfire season can be can be painful. And it's funny, one of these uh, early business lessons I learned was this fairly successful, uh, let's just call him a merchant banker. I'm not too sure how successful they are, but effectively... It's always been rhyming slang, but anyway, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> merchant banker. But he basically says, don't change your business to suit the weather only put your business where the weather suits. As simple and profound as that is, don't go and go into business and change it because the weather is changing. Only go and establish yourself where it suits. Not always easy to do. That's very easy. It's a good, <laughs> it's a good piece of advice and it's um, certainly a good thing to hear at the beginning of the journey. Uh, we yeah. talked previously about what do you do when you're already on the journey. Yeah. And you've got to, you kind of come to that fork in the road moment. Maybe that's a useful piece of advice to revisit. So so talk about bad luck. The guy's got a good business. It's got some interesting concepts to it. So what does he do? What what, do you, what sticks in your mind about this guy as a, as a good business person when he's had the three strikes in your house? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the first discussions we actually had was actually me trying to stop him from wanting to formally appoint a liquidator or an administrator. And I actually mapped out for him, if you can do this and this and this and, and get some capital in from one of your partners, you've potentially got a chance of survival. But it's going to be a long, hard road because who, who knows how long this pandemic's going to go for. And uh, I think when he sort of went away and thought about it, a couple of weeks, I think, he came back and said, you know what, I just don't have the energy to be able to do everything that you said. I could see it would work, but I just don't have the energy for it. And he basically he just put the white flag up and said, uh, I'm pretty much toast. But live to fight another day. In some form. After, say, 1,500, you know, sort of insolvency cases uh, under my belt, you get an impression of who are the good people that actually try and actually make money, try and make profits, want to pay taxes because if you're paying taxes, you're making money, try to employ people versus who's going into business because I think business is, if I can rip someone else off, that's good business. You know, there, there watch is, too much Wall Street yeah, or the Wolf of Wall Street or one of those yeah. kind of shows, yeah. yeah. Or too many mafia movies, you know, yeah. where, hey, if you didn't see me coming to rip you off, you shouldn't be in business. The people that really are so passionate about the business they're putting in they throw everything in the kitchen sink at it they throw all their personal wealth at it because they they so believe in this business and and they also see it as their ticket out if i can get this business to work and it could be worth bazillions of dollars well then there's my ticket to freedom and that this guy did do that so why the bad luck element is is as soon as he had to begrudgingly wave the white flag which he did responsibly he waved the white flag and said i'm i'm toast the guy was pretty much living out of a caravan moments after that because he he'd thrown everything at it so there's some lessons there about uh, again about leaving some money aside but it's really hard to stop you know business consume so much of your life they become part of who you are in a lot of ways just having a distinction having a place to go in your mind and in your life which isn't your business because sometimes it can be all of you so other examples that we've uh, small business former small business Um, Woodsman used to talk about the tram lines in Sydney being bad luck for the businesses that are relying on the foot traffic that go to a cafe that suddenly had a construction zone outside the front. You've spoken of shopping centre examples. Yeah, shopping centre examples are actually quite brutal because uh, depending on uh, who the ultimate shopping centre owner is, and I won't mention any names, but some of the big ones are very tough to be in business with as landlords because they some of them just give you no mercy as a tenant. So as an example, if a shopping centre made the decision to renovate the shop or change up the car parking infrastructure or close the entry to your door where most of your customers come in from, and as a result, the customers have to come in from a different entry, you know, miles away, it has an immediate impact on that business that's right at the beginning of the door there. They lose immediate turnover. So they can immediately see a reduction in turnover. They then go to the no-named landlord of this major shopping centre and say, look, your decision to renovate, your decision to to improve this shopping centre on a global basis has caused me to lose revenue, in turn profit, in turn, I'm not in good way here. Can we please get some relief from our rent? And the, quite often the answer is no. And I just, I find that just mind boggling. Sort of almost like bad luck. Bad luck, I guess, for it is you're dealing with a very, very tough landlord that just doesn't want to capitulate. And the landlord's position looking at you as the tenant can sometimes be, well, have a look at how impressive my shopping center is. Have a look at my branding. I'm so well known here. If you as a tenant aren't in that shop, I could easily replace you with someone else. And by the way, I'm going to take your bank guarantee along the journey. It's pretty brutal. So I think that's one of the key lessons is that you should expect a level of bad luck. If you don't get it, fantastic. So if you've always won every card game you've ever played, every time you buy a lotto ticket, oh, you'll get something. 
the happy days. Well done, you. But for the rest of us, life will spin you. It could be a health issue. It could be any of that sort of stuff. You've got to be, so it's a bit of about having a plan B, realising that the good times are, while they're great, Gunning it. There's also that thing, don't always expect the good times to last forever. Well, well, the, uh, the other classic saying is plan for the best and expect the worst. So in other words, you know, just always have a cognizant mindset. Okay, what if everything goes horribly wrong? I guess have a contingency plan is probably where you're getting at, James. You know, you plan B type scenario. But it also is an indication too, is don't put all the eggs in one basket. Sometimes uh, retailers that are moving physical or fast moving consumer goods, there is a benefit in having a store that's available to foot traffic but there's also a benefit to just putting your business online so that consumers can buy it and as long as you've got good logistics systems you can shoot it out there maybe it's a bit of both maybe it's a bit of I've got my bricks and mortar store and an online presence so that way if anything blows up the likes I've at least got an avenue to to generate revenue we've talked about that's different from pivoting now there are some people in the world, like we've discussed before about the bloke who had car parks close to town and during COVID switched to hand wash. Yeah. Now, well done him. Awesome. I've, I've ticked that box so many times. Yeah, you're awesome. I'm not that guy and lots of people aren't. Don't pivot to stuff that you've got no idea about. Company at the moment that does chemicals, I, I understand they're going to go into four-wheel drives. Don't quite get the whole connection. Yeah, but that's, the synergy. I don't get the synergy. So we're talking about, about a plan B is something that you can spin onto or rely on and it's counter-cyclical or you know, if people can't come to your shop, is there another way that they can get access to your merchandise and that sort of stuff. Interesting question, isn't it? Totally. And I guess the pandemic really did show this concept of pivot. And I know it's a bit of a dirty word because everyone's like, oh, pivot, that's so last year. But people were forced to pivot as a result because, as an example, professional services firms that weren't considered essential workers had to basically exit the CBD and get all their staff to work from home. Now, if you weren't structured already for that, you are, you are in for a bad day. And some professional services firms got caught out because they didn't have the infrastructure in place to allow remote access to their, their servers and the databases and the software programs. That was like a forced pivot. But if you're in business and you sort of go, well, I, I can, right from the beginning, I'm going to have an online presence and a brick and mortar presence. That's not a pivot. That's structuring your business to cover two different markets and just in case one of those markets fails. That's a great way to finish off. The difference between bad luck and bad management, sometimes there's a bit of both in it, but at the end of the day, what's your plan B? What can you do? Do you have a fallback position? A lot of us who are in business just throw everything at it. Is there an escape strategy? Is there an exit? I knew a bunch of people who used to do training that always have an exit strategy. That always, whatever they were, that always make sure they knew how to get out of the building. They actually seemed to know how to get out of the country. They were some strange people. But the point was that they always had a plan. They always had a plan. And <laughs> yeah. I, I do like the fact that they always had a plan. Thanks, Chris. No, That's been great. See you. All of us. See ya. A reminder that these podcasts are general in nature and do not constitute advice and they don't take into account your personal circumstances. So if you think, though, that some of the issues raised might apply to you, you should seek qualified financial, legal or counselling advice.